so today, here's what I want to do. Three talks. First one's going to be cosmic. Second one's going to be prophetic. Third one's going to be missionary. Say with me. Cosmic. cosmic. Prophetic. Cosmic. Missionary. Okay, you ready to go to the cosmos? I thought we'd start with the big picture. The big picture. And I want to ask for a specific grace for each of, the, each of our talks. I want to pray that the Holy Spirit, whose mission it is to reveal to every human heart the glory and the majesty of Jesus. Because, yeah, just, I'm going to just ask the Lord, Lord, Father in heaven, in the name of your beloved Son, by the way, Father, we, we are your children, and we're, we're so grateful, we're so glad to gather today as your children. We love you, and we're thrilled and fascinated by what you've done for us in Jesus. And we ask, Father, that the Holy Spirit would stir in us and awaken in us a greater understanding of the glory of your Son, Jesus, and the glory that he's bestowed on us which is the ground of our hope, which is the source of our hope. Come Holy Spirit. Come Holy Spirit and awaken our hearts, enlighten our minds, cast the fire of the glory of the King into our hearts. Help us see what you see, feel what you feel, Know what you know. For the glory of your name, Jesus. Amen. Okay. Um, I want to start with a passage. I'm going to spend a fair amount of time in the catechism, but, but I want to start with a passage from Colossians 1.27. Colossians 1.27. And, and Paul is writing to the community in Colossae, and Colossae talking about, in this section, the mystery that was hidden for ages has now been revealed even to the Gentiles. What's that mystery? Paul describes it in a very concise way. And I love it when he does this because it kind of captures what's at the core, the center. What does he say? Christ in you, the hope of glory. That's right. Christ in you, the hope of glory. Let's say it together. Christ in you. The hope of glory. Turn to somebody next to you and say, the Christ in you. The hope of glory. Right, right. So why do you have any hope at all? Yes, because Christ died on a cross. He was raised from the dead. And he seats, is seated at the right hand of God the Father in heaven. And what is so special about that? I mean, it's obviously special, but for you as a human being, why does it, why is it, so astounding, Mary. Because he's in me. Because he's in you. He, but how can he be in you? How is it possible for him to be in you? Why did he have to go through what he went through in order to be in you? What did he come to do? He came to save a race of people that was dead in sin and had no future. We were separated, alienated from God, every human being born into sin, under the slavery to sin, and destined for eternal separation from God. That's the condition of the human race. But for God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him would not die but would have everlasting life. But wait a minute, we all die anyway. We die biologically. Because, but God had something else in mind. And what the apostles said, what we have seen, what we have heard, what we have touched, we declare to you that the eternal life that was with God has appeared to us. Heaven has come down. And we've seen a life that we, no one has ever seen. And it's in a person. And how do we know that? Because we saw, we heard him preach. We saw him heal. We saw the signs and wonders. But most of all, we saw him die and he came alive again. Amen. There was a life in him that was stronger than death. And that life was in a body, in a person, a, the son of Mary. No human being had ever experienced that. Human flesh had never, ever been united to God in that way. It never happened before, but it happened in Jesus. God's plan of salvation is to bring, salvation is to bring the life of heaven and to give it away and to find its home in human flesh. 
Jesus came to save this race of people who bear the image of God. So that's why he became one of us. So that he could take a race of people that Paul says, we've all sinned and fall short of what? Glory. Okay, not bad. We've all sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Right, so sin causes us to fall from the glory we were destined to have. The glory is God's renown, his majesty, his beauty, his power. And Adam and Eve walked and were near to God on it. But it wasn't living in them the way it lives in those who are baptized into Christ. That's why we say on Easter, oh, happy fault. You know that, that, that great hymn in the hymn, oh, happy fault. That sin, how God turns sin on its head. And we get what, something even greater out of it. So Jesus takes on human flesh and he comes to declare the kingdom. And he begins to reveal God's glory. And what the catechism tells us is his glory is the spirit, the Holy Spirit that was in him and upon him. You want me to give you the reference to that so you can uh, take a look at it when you go home? Okay, I could, just, I could also read it to you. So you, you don't have to just trust, take my word for it. You can, uh... I think we would. Okay. <laughs> I'll read a couple, a couple of these to you. These are, these are so good. These are so good, they're worth reading. Um, paragraph 665 of the Catechism. 665. Christ's ascension, really the resurrection, the ascension happened at two different moments but it's one fundamental reality. Jesus rose to ascend to the right hand of the Father so that he could sit on the throne and he could be Lord of all things, okay? Christ's ascension marks the definitive entrance of Jesus' humanity into God's heavenly domain. So in the person of Jesus, he's the new Adam. And where does the, the, the old Adam was what? Separated from God because of sin. Where does the new Adam go? New, Jesus takes human flesh into the holy place and the son of Mary takes his seat on the throne at the right hand of God. Hallelujah. Yeah, that's good. Hallelujah. That's worth the hallelujah. <laughs> Paragraph 668. Christ died and lived again that he might be Lord of the dead and of the living. That means he has power over all of it. Christ's ascension in, into heaven signifies his participation in his humanity in God's power and authority. Jesus Christ is Lord. He possesses all power in heaven and on earth, and he is far above all rule, authority, power, and dominion, for the Father has put all things under his feet. Paragraph 669. As the Lord, Christ is the, also the head of the church, which is his body, which is us. He says, he was taken up into heaven and he was glorified. Your destiny is to be taken up into heaven and to be glorified. Because the Son of Man took human flesh and gave it a future. A future in glory that only he possesses. He's a life-giving spirit. Okay, there's a couple other golden ones here. The mission of the Holy Spirit. Jesus Christ is, an, is the word Christ means anointed, right? We know that. Jesus means what? Anointed. The name Jesus means what? Not anointed. Yes. Jesus is saved, Savior, right? Savior. Christ means anointed. And he's Lord, all power and authority. He's come to save, and how does he save us? He comes with his anointing, and his anointing is the Spirit. And his, his goal was to communicate the Spirit that was in him to us. To give what he possessed in fullness, he gave it to us. And so how can we who are sinful be united to the Holy God, to the Holy Spirit of the Holy God? We can't do that on our own power. Jesus became a sacrifice for sin, a perfect offering of love to the Father. He died on a cross. And he did the one thing he never should have done, Scripture says, from the, devil, from the devil's point of view. He spilled the blood that made us clean. 
The Old Testament tells us there's no, there's no uh, purification without, and no purification of sin without the cleansing and the shedding of blood. That's what the whole temple sacrifice was foretelling in throughout all uh, Jewish history until Jesus came to become the Lamb of God. And it's a perfect offering that he made of love to the Father. And what's so beautiful, friends, he fulfilled the first and the second commandment, what he called the first and the greatest thing when he was asked, Master, what's the greatest commandment? He said, you tell me. He went on to say, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. And then Jesus said, this is the first, and this is the greatest thing possible. And there it's perfected, right there. John chapter 14, Jesus said to his apostles, just be on Holy Thursday night, he said to them, I'm not going to be with you much longer because the devil's coming after me. But he said, don't worry, the devil has no hold on me. Like the devil wasn't in charge of that night. The devil has no hold on me. He said, but here's what I want my friends to know. What you're going to see, I do everything the Father commands me to do because I love the Father. I want everyone to see what's going to happen tonight and tomorrow. It's first about my love for the Father. I trust Him with everything. And from that cross, He said, I want the whole world to know. And I'm so glad the Catholic churches, we still have crucifixes, because He's telling us something with His arms wide open to the world. He's saying, look at me. Why am I here? First, because I love the Father. I want all of you to know He's totally trustworthy. And to love Him is to obey His commands. Philippians chapter 2, you know, He emptied Himself and He became obedient unto death, death on a cross. The love language of heaven is obedience from the heart to the commandments. Jesus said, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. So Philippians 2, the great hymn to the Lord is he humbled himself by becoming obedient. Father, I trust you. It's scary. This cup is hard. This is difficult. But Father, I trust you no matter what. This is the worst thing that can happen to a human being on earth, right? Not only just that he dies, but he's humiliated, stripped naked, a, you know, crucified outside the wall of his own city. He's mocked, he's ridiculed, he's betrayed, he's abandoned. Everything human beings fear. His skin was torn off his body. His skin was, you know, he was pierced by the sword. He was beaten, he was spit upon, he was mocked. This is the stuff everybody would be afraid of experiencing, right? I mean, we, don't, we have a hard day if someone looks sideways at us, right? <laughs> please like me, please like me, you know, be nice to me, you know. And he's saying, Father, you want me to drink that cup? Yes, son, I do. Not my will, but yours be done. Because you are good, Father. You are trustworthy. You are wise. You are loving, right? And he said, this is what I want my friends to know. Jesus, we are your friends and we see it. We hear the message. And he died for us too. Because he did what? He, he made himself a sacrifice for sin. He was a sin offering. The devil did the one thing he never should have done in his pride. He pierced the flesh and shed the blood of the perfect son of God. And that blood became for us a cleansing to take away sin. And when you were baptized into Christ, you were united to that cross and the blood of Jesus, he cleansed you. How? So why? So that the Spirit of God could be given to you and you could be born again. You're born again by water and the Spirit. You became a new creation. You received the down payment of the Spirit of God. The new creation is already in you. That's why you have hope. It's not like, oh man, I hope someday. It's already in you. You're already born again. Say with me, I am. Born again. I am. Born again. I am. Forgiven. I've been washed by the blood of the Lamb of God. That's a fact. That's why you have hope. Because the one who conquered sin, the one who conquered death, 
the one who moved, passed from death to life and, and is the new creation. He's begun existence beyond death. He's the only one. He's the new humanity. How does that happen? By you being united to the life of God. Too many people think Christianity Catholicism is like it's like a moral system and it's about sin management and just be good and just behave and all that kind of stuff. And it becomes a human work, right? It's his gift to us. And he does want us to obey and he does want us to follow his gift. But it starts with what he did for us, not what we did for him, right? So it doesn't matter, friends, what happens to the world. We care about the world. We love the world. We want to make the best contribution we can. It doesn't even matter what happens to me, to my body, right? to my finances, to my whatever. Yes, I'd like everything to be wonderful in this world. I'd like to be a smashing success. I'd like to be famous and rich and powerful and very nice and all that kind of stuff. I mean, that's what human beings all want in different ways, to one degree or another. But it's easy for us to pursue those things and forget what really matters and where the real gold is. All that other stuff is gonna pass away. There's been 29 or 31 civilizations in human history. And they're, they're just now, most of them are just gone. They're just gone. As, and this one's going to go. It's going to go. It's not going to last forever. What's that? Yeah, and we might be. I mean, we're sliding. I mean, when civilizations like Augustine, Augustine said, was asked the question, why do civilizations die? He said, civilizations die because men begin to love the wrong thing. Which means they worship it. Which means they, they want it with all their heart. Right? Pope Benedict XVI described the time we're living in this way. He said, in vast areas of the world today, the faith is in danger of dying out like a flame which no longer has fuel. He said, what's happening is humanity is pushing God from the human horizon. He said, and when the light from God is pushed away, what happens? Darkness begins to settle in on the human mind. And remember what Jesus said? You call darkness light. I'm the light of the world. What I say is real. What you say is a fantasy. Right? And he said, as a result, Paul Benedict said, as a result, humanity is losing its bearings with increasingly evident and destructive effects. Right? And who's the light of the world? Okay, who else is the light of the world? Huh? Huh? You're the light of the world. Why? Because you li he lives in you. That's why you're the light of the world. The light of the world is heaven has come. The light of the world is the spirit of God has been poured out on fallen human flesh that had no future. That's the light of the world. You know? It's not just, it's not just human understanding. There's divine understanding and revelation about where we've come from, why we're here, where we're going, what's our destiny, what has God done for us? Right? And when we lose sight of that, and we lose sight of this treasure that's hidden where? In earthen vessels. Look around. You see some earthen vessels here? Some pretty pathetic ones. I'm getting, you know, I'm getting there, you know? Yeah. But in Peter Herbeck is a life that will never die. And though my body's wasting away, right? God's glory is growing in me. So I don't have to whine and be afraid and be paralyzed by fear, by, by death and sickness and all that stuff. You say, okay, I don't want any of that, but guess what? It's going to come. Yeah, amen. All right? And I can unite it to the king and his suffering for the salvation of the world, and soon I'm going to be home. And when you go into that good night, you know, you're taken away from everything, family, everybody and you go into that dark and as soon as you get there someone's going to call your name he's coming for his father's children he knows why 
Each one of you was particularly made by the Father to give glory for all eternity to Him and to, jo and to rejoice in His creation. Every one of us has a distinct purpose. Every one of us is a, is a unique reflection. Every one of us was made to radiate that, what we call glory, in the way He's going to make it come through you for all eternity. Isn't that amazing? And then Jesus, the firstborn son of the new creation, is coming for you. And he'll come into that darkness. He will shed his light. He will call your name. He'll take you by the hand. He'll make sure that you're purified fully. And then he's going to take you to the Father. Isn't that great? I mean, now that's something to hope in. Yeah, right there. And hope is not wishful thinking. It's not positive thinking. Hope is the confident expectation of the fulfillment of God's promises in my life. I'm confident. Hope is the confident expectation that the promises of God will be fulfilled in my life. I am confident, not in my strength, not just in my wits. I'm confident in the one who has proven his love for me. While I was yet a sinner, Christ died for me. His love conquered my sin, and it's still doing it every day. <laughs> I mean, it's amazing that he loves us. I mean, seriously, he loves us so much, it's unbelievable. I mean, he truly, truly loves us. He loves you infinitely more than your mother loves you. Try that on for size. You know? And moms or grandmas or whoever is that person, think about it, who most loves you unconditionally. That person is reflecting Jesus, the love of the Father toward you. Right? And isn't it amazing that the down payment, which is the spirit that's given to us, what does the spirit do in us, does Paul say in the eighth chapter of Romans? He groans in us. And the spirit has a mission. He says the spirit speaks to our spirit, telling us what? That we're children of God. You see, the spirit gives us conviction that we can't access on our own strength because human beings live with a constant feeling of alienation. It's all over the world, it's everywhere. I don't care if you're in the, I don't care. I mean, for heaven's sakes, Tiger Woods, I'm, you know, I'm not, he's just a pu public figure. I mean, that guy had what almost every man on the planet would define as the most awesome life. First of all, he played, I mean, he's a physical freak, right, and he's gifted. He plays a sport you can play till you're 90, as long as you have health, you know? He's the best at it in the whole world. All, the, I mean, millionaires and billionaires around the world want to play golf with him. This guy, when he went to, he played golf in, in one of those uh, Middle Eastern countries, which one was it? Uh, Air, the United Arab Emirates. The king there wanted to play golf, paid him a million dollars to play a round of golf with him. Oh, Isn't that insane? It's totally insane. He was the most famous athlete on the planet. He was, he was one of the most famous persons on the whole planet. People love money, people love power, people love fame, right? And then he was married to a gorgeous, beautiful wife who loved him. And he had two beautiful little kids. So just in the language of the world, he had a trophy wife, he had everything. He had mansions all around the world, he had jets, he had yachts, he had the whole nine yards. And he's hitting on a 16-year-old waitress from Denny's. And he loses everything because he can't control himself because he's so empty and he's such, in such bondage to sin. There's something wrong in his heart, there's something broken in him. You know, people, when pe big people like that go down, lots of people like to rejoice in it, you know. but. What got, what got manifested right before the world and for the men of the world is to say, guys, it's not an, all that stuff's not enough. It's not enough. You're made for more. 
And if you don't know that more, you will be alienated to your own internal being. I mean, you won't even know yourself. And you'll battle depression and discouragement, anxiety, alienation, isolation, all these kinds of things. You know? So the Spirit of God is giving us heavenly power to have a lasting, life-changing conviction about what's going on inside you and who you are. Romans 8, the Spirit of God bears witness to our spirit that we're children of God, and the Spirit of God helps us cry out, Abba, Father. I don't have to be afraid of God in that slavish kind of way. There's a power in you that your flesh keeps working against. You gotta, what does Paul say in that same chapter? If by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, the flesh, you will live. If you put to death that drive in you, that's me first, me first, or my own pleasure, my own self, um, or the lies of the enemy that say you're the one God's not happy with, you know, you're the one, you've done enough now, you're out, you know, or you're basically a disappointment to him or something like that, you know. The devil always tries to lie about that stuff, to take away our identity, our childhood, you know. Why do you think, friends, the world is running, is totally obsessed with identity, 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 our politics, everything, identity, identity, identity. And why do you think there's like thousands of identities, millions of identities, they keep multiplying like crazy. This is what I am, this is what I am, this is what I am. Affirm me, affirm me, affirm me, this is what I am, affirm me, right? Because the only identity that will ever satisfy the human heart is the one we receive. If I create my own identity, no matter how many people clap for me, when I'm alone, I know I made it up. And I'm, therefore, it's make-believe. I made it up. I'm not the origin of my existence. I don't know how I got here. Are you kidding? I didn't design myself. And so, when the Christian understands that our identity is received, God tells me who I am. He made me. And that's totally freeing. But people have to be able to hear it in love that God made me. God made me the way, and he tells me who I am. That's where I get it from. I don't assert it. I don't assert it, push it, drive it, you know? But that's the battle, that's the battle the human race is in. In the world of flesh and the devil, that's it. And humans are profoundly vulnerable, profoundly vulnerable because of this battle, because of the real original sin, because of the world that we live in that's fallen. You know, we're not the masters of our own destiny. It's not real. You know? So this is why it's crucial for Christians to know what God has done in them. This is what it means to be light. This is the light you bring. It's the thing God did and is doing in the world for the salvation of the world. Does that make sense? Now tell me I didn't, I didn't cause you in that last set of comments that didn't unsettle you a little bit, like thinking about the world and what we're facing and the challenges we're facing in our own families and our extended families. It's there, it's real, it's hard, it's heartbreaking. And there's tremendous pressure tremendous pressure to just start saying yes everybody whoever you say you are that's who you are whatever life is you say it that's what it is you know I mean look at how look at how President Biden is wrestling with this 
abortion, I mean, the abortion question. He can't, he can't even say, you know, life begins at conception because it's politically not helpful for him, you know? Things that are so manifest and so important in that what the church stands on. I mean, if he wasn't Catholic, I wouldn't worry about it, I mean, you know? But I mean, as a Catholic, to not know that, to not say that is just, but he's caught in a whirlwind of politics, of power. What do I do? What do I say? How do I keep my constituency? What about, blah, 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 blah. what's the cost if I do say it? Da, 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 da. I mean, it's just pressure, 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 you know? I'm not, I'm not, um, what's the word I'm looking for? I'm not making excuses for him in that sense. I just interviewed a, a former senator from Chicago, a, a congressman from Chicago, yes, two days ago, Dan Lipinski, you know? And at one point, he was the only Democrat who stood up for life at one point during the period of the Obama administration. And he took some huge hits for it. He took a big hit for it. He's a good man. He's smart, smart dude. Good guy, tough Polish guy, you know? Now, before I end, we're, we're gonna say a little prayer, but I wanna do a little, little catechism with you. Let's uh, go through, I'm gonna find Thessalonians. Yeah, here it is, okay. For us to, the, the cosmic picture that I've been drawing is, is, is the saving work of God. And to try to help you know and help us see what glory means, right? Humanity can reach the glory we long to have. We, we, we want to be glorified, that we're made for that really, you know? That's why we love getting trophies and we love accomplishing great things and all that kind of stuff, you know? And that's okay. That stuff's okay, but that never fully satisfies us. You know, that's why guys sell their Hall of, Hall of Fame rings on eBay and things like that eventually. It never fully satisfies. It's temporary. It points to something greater. You're made for that glory that will never end and that will finally heal your soul. It'll finally bring you, it, you talk about integration and health, where joy and peace and love and the fruits of the Spirit are, are in your soul in a way it's hardly even to imagine how beautiful it is, you know? That's how God's creation, God's gonna, you know how you see a beautiful rose, like some flowers in the summer, and you see, you just, you're just overtaken by their beauty? And that thing's giving glory to God. It is what it was made for. It's giving glory to God. It's beautiful. It grabs our heart, you know? You are made to give glory to God for all eternity and his creation. He's gonna make all things new. Everything's gonna give glory to God and everything will reach its fulfillment. And you will too, but it's a gift. It's not my creation. AI's not gonna do it for me, you know? I mean, human power can't do it. You know, good for us, God gave us minds to, have, to create things, that's great. But it will never give us what we really need and long for most. That's God's gift to us, right? So here's Paul. And what the apostles do at the beginning of their letters, we should take as a habit in our life. They always begin their letters with what God has done for us before they talk about what we're supposed to do for God. That gets turned around a lot, you know? And, and it's really important to know that because only when we know who we are when we know that we are who he said we are and we are what he's done for us and in us and we, it begins to tenderize our hearts and enlighten our mind, only then can we live out the love that he's calling us to live. So, I'll end here. What time, was I supposed to stop at quarter two? You're fine. Okay, I'll, I'll just end with this little, we'll just do this little moment and we'll pray. So here's Paul, this is typical of Paul. Second Thessalonians chapter two, uh, verse 13. So he's talking to this community that's very, it's persecuted, it's going through lots of struggles, difficulties, and he says, uh, but we are bound, that's he and the brothers who are with him. I think he was writing this from prison. We who are bound to give thanks to God always for you, brethren, beloved by the Lord. So he's telling them who they are. You're beloved by the Lord. Say, I am, I am. Beloved. beloved. I am, I am. Beloved. beloved. Turn to somebody next to you and say, you are, you are. Beloved. beloved. Okay. So that's the first thing he wants them to know as a good pastor, right? 
uh, beloved by the Lord, because God chose you. Say with me, I am, I am. Chosen. chosen. I am, I am. Beloved. beloved. He chose you for what? From the beginning, for what? To be saved. Say with me, I am, I am. Saved. saved. I am, I am. Saved. saved. And as Catholics, we understand that to mean I have been saved, I am being saved, and I will be saved, right? Yep. It's a whole process Jesus saved. We're not saved until we're home in glory, ultimately, right? Yep. Right, but we're saved from the sting of death and sin as we stand in the Lord. So anyway, so you're beloved, you're chosen, and you're saved. Okay, Paul wants you to know how you were saved through sanctification by the Spirit. Say with me, I am? I am. Sanctified. Sanctified. And saved. And saved. Okay, what does sanctified mean? You were made holy. Where did that happen? In baptism, what I was describing earlier. That's where the sanctification happened. That's where it began. That's, and the sanctification is cleansed from sin and the life of God breathed into you. That's what it is. Isn't that beautiful? And it's going to just keep growing in you. And it never stops for all eternity. And you were set apart. You were chosen to be saved. You were, to be saved, you were sanctified by the Spirit, right, in baptism, and for belief in the truth. Right? Say, I believe. In the truth, that is Christ. To this he called you through our gospel. This is why the church exists to evangelize. Because what I'm describing is what the church wants to give to the world, an instrument of God's grace. And what Paul tells us, how does it come? Through the gospel, the good spiel, the good news. The good news is given. He said, so it came through the gospel so that you may obtain something. And here's the climax that you may obtain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Think about that. Say, I am, I am. Headed, headed for glory. For glory. How about that? You have a future. You have a destiny. The futures we have in this world are good. We need to be fulfill what we're called to do here on earth, but you need to live on this earth with your heart in heaven. You know where your life is going. You know who has you in his hands. And what you're doing, he says, you, you've been given this so you can obtain, you've been beloved, you've been chosen, you've been saved, you've been sanctified for in the truth and in the spirit so that you can obtain the glory that belongs to a person, Jesus Christ. This is why he's the only savior of the world. No one else can do this. And it doesn't happen by just being a good person. It comes through repentance and believing in Jesus and being baptized into him and becoming a child of God. Isn't that beautiful? Yeah, beautiful. Okay, Absolutely. let's end with a prayer. Why don't we stand? If you can stand, but if you can't right now, that's okay. If you'd rather not, I mean. Let's just turn our hearts to the Lord and receive. Jesus, we delight and we're really amazed at what you've done in us. Holy Spirit, I ask that you would, in this moment, do your work to help us see and believe. Come Holy Spirit. Release your kingdom. And say with me if you'd like, Lord Jesus, show me your glory. Show me your glory. Lord Jesus, reveal your glory. Come Holy Spirit. Let's just wait on the Lord. Father, we thank you for the gift of your beloved Son. We thank you for your amazing plan of salvation. We thank you that we have been loved, chosen, saved, sanctified for the purpose of receiving the glory that lives in your Son in superabundance, overflowing for the salvation of the world. Father, your plan is great. In the name of your Son, Jesus, 
Amen.